the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, ace operator of the International Secret Police, and Barney Dunlap, also of the police, are flying to Hong Kong, China, via the China Clipper, to end the smuggling activities of the world's most dreaded criminal, the octopus. At the Honolulu stopover, they become acquainted with Marsha Winfield, governess to little Jean Kingsley, and are startled when she tells them that she took the position so that she could go to China in search of the octopus who has brought tragedy into her life. She asks their protection for the duration of the trip for the little girl's sake. Meanwhile, the octopus has dispatched a renegade aviator, Splinters, in a special bullet plane to await the arrival of the China Clipper at Wake Island, and there, kidnapped Speed Gibson. At the moment, however, we find the boys talking things over several hundred feet in the air, about half an hour out of Midway Island. Yeah... You know, I wouldn't mind living on one of these clipper ships the rest of my life. Rides as easy as a big, calm yacht. Good feed, sightseeing, and a guy can get a good night's sleep in one of them (laughs) berths. The one you got at Honolulu, huh, Barney? You're darn tootin', Speed. What with you and Clint using me as a battlefield to capture that smuggler? (laughs) Well, your snoring wasn't any lullaby for us, either. (laughs) Is that so? If I hadn't snored, Speed wouldn't have been awake to see that smuggler. Climbed up to our balcony at the hotel. <laughs> it's no use, Clint. You can't top Barney. <laughs> He's the champion alibi Ike of the service. Yeah, what do you mean, alibi Ike? Well, I won't go into painful details now. After all, I'm just supposed to be Pierre Dorsey, the French tutor to your son here, Earl. And you're Jim Fletcher, the Texas oil man, now remember. How can I forget it with you reminding me every half hour? By the way, where's Miss Winfield and Jean? In the lounge. Miss Winfield's writing letters. Oh, think I'll see if she needs any help. No, no, you don't, Romeo. You stay right here with us where I can keep an eye on you. Okay. Nothing to do, though. Nothing to do? Gee, Barney, in just a little while we'll cross the international date line. Just think, we've been flying like 60 ever since we took off from Midway Island, and we'll still lose a day. Lose a day flying at this speed? How do you figure that? Because we crossed the international date line. If we were coming the other way, from China... Then we'd leave Wake one day and arrive at Midway the day before. Clint, do you think the altitude's getting the kid? <laughs> no, Steve's right, Barney. You pass over the same line on boats, you know. You're just confused because we're traveling so much faster. Oh, I get it now. Say, they always have some sort of celebration on a boat. Last time I crossed over the equator, they ducked me and held me under for a whole day. At least that's the way it seemed to me. I'll bet you were red as a boy of lobster when they pulled you out. <laughs> and that's funny, huh? <laughs> I wonder if they'll have a celebration up here crossing the date line in the air, as they do on shipboard crossing the equator. Nah, and if they do, they can count me out. For once, I'm going to be the watching audience. Watch it. Here comes one of the stewards. Hmm? Oh, as I was saying, Monsieur Fletcher, the clipper route is fascinating. You will remember that soon after we left Honolulu, we passed over the very sands that Sir Charles Kingsford Smith used as a landing field for his Southern Cross plane when he blazed the first sky route from San Francisco to Sydney, Australia. Uh, Thank pardon, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Fletcher? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yes, Stuart? Uh, The captain's compliments, sir, and he asks if you will not impersonate Father Time for the usual ceremonies when we pass over the time demarcation line. You mean to say that you have ceremonies up here in the air for that? Oh, yes, sir. Everything but the immersion, of course. <laughs> you are going to be in the watching audience. <laughs> yeah, that's right, lad. I should have stayed at Midway Island and enjoyed the fishing. Father time. <laughs> Radio OC34, call in shortwave station OC127. OC34, call in OC127. Come in, please. Gotta come in quick enough. I don't think that octopus ever leaves his set. He talks to me more by radio than when I'm with him in Hong Kong. Uh Uh-oh. 
Here he comes. OC-127 to OC-34. OC-127 to OC-34. Stand by for two-way conversation. OC-34 already for two-way. Flinders? Yes, sir. I just sighted Wake Island. We'll land there shortly. Can't see nothing of the China Clipper yet. Wait at Wake Island. Clipper will probably lay over since there we were the report forms of typhoon in Formosan waters heading for Wake Island. Typhoon? Well, that'll drown him, all right. That's a piece of weather that even I won't buck. You might, Splinters. What do you mean? The plane will naturally arouse curiosity. You have the story you are to tell the aviation officials. That you are trying to establish a new speed record between Guam and Wake Island for your own satisfaction. I got all that straight, but what about flying in a typhoon? Once you get speed, Gibson, you will have to take off, no matter what kind of flying weather you have. But, Octopus, you might as well tell me to send my bullet plane in a nosedive into the ocean right now. Typhoon flying is just another name for suicide. Are you going to obey my orders? You know what awaits you here if you fail? And don't think that you can escape me by going elsewhere. Remember, the tentacles of the octopus. I can reach you anywhere. Oh, I know. I thought you wanted Speed Gibson alive. I want to strike at Clint Barlow. Losing his nephew will remove Barlow from the chase. What happens to the boy is of little interest to me. But my life, sir, I... What are you going to do? I'll get Speed Gibson. We'll fly into the typhoon if we must. That is better. You have full instructions. You are to stay by the plane as much as possible. So you will be in constant communication with me. Yes, sir. I'm circling Wake Island now. Very well. Land and tell your story to the officials. And tell it well. Tell it so that they will believe it. Or you will have to answer to me. I thought we never would get out of that lounge performance. <laughs> oh, father time himself, huh? Yeah, you've still got some cotton whiskers hanging on your chin there. <laughs> I'll take them all, Barney. Thanks, kid. I was kind of nervous when the steward was putting them on me. Thought maybe he'd find out I had a phony mustache and a squint. Yes, uh, he was laughing too hard to examine your face, pal. You should have seen yourself when they put that paper crown on your head. It looked more like a dunce cap. Yeah, well, let me tell you, not all dunces wear caps. No. Jose, get off your high horse, cowboy. Here comes Gene. Now, remember who you are. Guess I'd better put these glasses on again, too. Hello, everybody. Mr. Fletcher, I want to tell you what a wonderful father time you made. I love you. You too, Jean. I thought you was my friend. I am. I wasn't laughing at you, but with you. You sure were having a good time initiating the passengers over the international date line. <laughs> and I'll have to admit I got a kick out of it, all right. Well, I'm sure glad to have one of these international date line certificates they give to everyone who flies over the line. Boy, listen to this. The main of Phoebus Apollo, ruler of the sun and heavens, know all people that Earl Fletcher, once earthbound and time laden, is now declared a subject of the realm of the sun and of the heavens with the freedom of our sacred eagle. That with the speed of our flaming chariot, this subject did fly the Pacific skies over the international date line, which mortals designed to mark off in the limit of days our eternal course through the skies. All right, all right. You didn't have to read your certificate to us. We all got one, and as far as I know, we can all read. Yeah, Pop, but I like the sound of those words. It makes you feel like, like somebody. I'm awfully proud of my certificate, too, Earl. And I like these pictures of the sun, moon, and stars around the edge, and the flaming chariot, and the clipper ship. I love this whole trip, especially the goonie birds. Mr. Dorsey... Do you think there'll be any goony birds on Wake Island like there was on Midway? Well, uh, very probably, mademoiselle. They're so funny and awkward. I would have liked one for a pet. You will have a heck of a time keeping a goony bird aboard the China Clipper. <laughs> I got a kick out of those goonies, but the birds that moaned and groaned gave me the heebie-jeebies. Wonder what they call them. Don't know, Bar. I mean, Pop. But the Clipper captain himself pointed out the terms frigate birds and giant albatross... Boy, they're colossal. They're col- colossal, Al. But do you hear that, Mr. Dorsey? You have to teach him better than that. Well, well youth always exaggerates, Monsieur Fletcher. Well, they were big, and so were the fish. 
Hope I can get in some more fishing at Wake Island. I think we'll have to stay in the hotel at Wake. Well, what do you mean, Jean? The steward just told Marcia that a typhoon was heading for Wake Island. We'd probably have to lay over until it passed. Typhoon lay over? Well, then we'll be late getting to Hong Kong. Oh, not very late, Miss Herr Fletcher. These typhoons are terrible, but very quick. Look, there's Wake Island ahead now. I don't see any signs of a storm anywhere. It's coming from Formosa, he said. The aviation weather reports give a clipper plenty of warning, Earl. They may have a half a day of clear flying weather ahead. But if there is any danger whatsoever of a bad storm crossing their path, they are ordered to remain grounded until all is clear once more. Well, as swell as this clipper plane is to ride in, I'll be glad to walk on land again. Sort of get air legs up here. It won't be long now. Oh, look at that pretty lagoon we're going to land in. And look, people are coming to the dock to meet us. You can certainly see good, Earl. Let me look through those glasses. Uh, uh no, they're, they're too strong for your eyes. Oh, everybody always gets excited when we come to a place, especially when it's in the middle of the ocean. Any sign of the typhoon yet? No, monsieur. But I see something else, Barney. Danger? I don't know, but I got a hunch. Look at that plane down there. Boy, a two-seater and built for terrific speed. No familiar identification marks. Barney, that plane looks more dangerous to me than a dozen typhoons. You think the octopus? We'll know soon enough, but watch yourself after we land. Anything can happen way out here in mid-Pacific and be called an accident. (laughs) 